verse, Gospel of chapter 15, verse 22. Last week, we looked at the man, Simon of Cyrene, in God's province. We brought him into the picture of the drama and how he carried the cross to Golgotha for his wonderful Saviour. So it's Mark 15, verse 22. And they bring him as Christ unto the place called Alpha, which is being interpreted the place of the skull. And they gave him to drink wine mingled with mirth, but he received it not. And when they had crucified him, they ordered his garments, casting knots upon them, but every man should take. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the superscription of his accusation was written over the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two thieves, one on his right hand and the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled with Seth, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple, and buildest it in three days, of course, they had no conception. He was speaking of his body, of course, he was full, died, he was buried, and then on the third day he rise again. But they had no concept, they thought he was talking about the literal temple, the first temple. Save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise, also the chief priests, mocking, said among themselves with the scribes, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him revive him. And the Lord will stop there, and the Lord will bless this portion of Scripture to us this evening. The physical suffering, although unimaginable, excruciating. I'm sure the Saviour was suffering in the physical realm, excruciating pain. Must have experienced in which, of course, we didn't, we don't have, in those days, we didn't have the medical treatment we have today. Excruciating pain, physical suffering that the, the Saviour was going through. In itself, it did not make his death unique. Because there were many, many other people who went through the same type of physical suffering than the Lord Jesus Christ did. Many, many were crucified. It was a form of execution in his day for the Romans. And tens of thousands from the 4th century BC, under the hands of the Persians, the Greeks and the Romans, had experienced the brutal death of crucifixion. So the physical suffering of Christ in itself did not make it unique from any other crucifixion. What made Christ's crucifixion different, unique, special from the rest was the spiritual application that Christ would die for our sins. It was unbearable for the Saviour who knew no sin, the spotless, sinless, perfect, pure, holy, and blemished one, would take our place, become a sin offering, to reconcile a people unto God. As God's justice, God's righteousness, and God's love, we looked at this morning, the redemption through Christ, even the forgiveness of sins, how God's justice, God's wrath, and God's love kissed each other in the person of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. God's righteousness, God's law, God's justice who is holy was being displayed, His wrath was being poured on Christ for our sake and yet His love for us, Jesus took the wrath we deserve, the judgment we deserve, the punishment we deserve. There's no greater display of love than the place of Calvary, in which the Son of God became that sin offering to redeem a people unto himself. 
He has given us peace through his cross. As the law of God could not condemn or gain credit or your own. The law, you see, has condemned every single person in this world apart from Christ. Because by the deeds of the law, no flesh can be justified. We've all broken God's law. And because God's law has been valued, there has to be judgment. But Christ paid the price in full. The ransom has been paid. And the Father was pleased and satisfied with that ultimate sacrifice once for all. As it is finished, the atonement and propitiation, Christ became that atonement. He took our place. And also he became that propitiation. He appeased God's wrath. God the Father was pleased. As he would redeem a people unto himself. But nevertheless, it must have been horrific. With great anticipation. As it was so intense as we looked at months, maybe a month or two months ago. When the Lord himself, before just proceeding the cross. He was in the garden of Gethsemane three times he prayed. And his disciples, especially the inner three, could not stay with him and pray. And uphold him in the place of prayer, no. They were asleep. And three times in the garden of Gethsemane, it says that his praying was so intense that it was like great sweats of blood come forth from the Saviour. Knowing later on that day, he would drink the full cup of divine wrath for the sins of his people. God and which God has chosen for salvation as he would become that atonement substitution and sacrifice. What a transaction. Tonight here as we go in front of this passage tonight as we look upon this passage I want to try and describe from this section these number of verses. <coughs> the first part of Christ's crucifixion <coughs> We can divide it into six parts tonight. Six parts from these 10 or 11 verses we've read this evening. Six different parts regarding the first part of Christ's crucifixion. First of all, we can look here at verse 23. We can title this the drink for the crucifixion. The drink for the crucifixion, verse 23. And they gave him the drink wine mingled with mirth, but he received it not. The Lord Jesus was not exhausted by the physical suffering. We've seen that last week. He was not exhausted that it came to a point that he couldn't carry the beam, the wooden beam, the cross any longer to the, to the place of Calvary. He was not weak physically. He was not exhausted by the physical suffering. He endured by being hit by a stick, by being punched in the face, done many times by being scourged, but scourged in himself would have killed men. It was that brutal. And he was not exhausted. His face was unrecognizable. His back was like a fire field. And he was not exhausted by the physical suffering. He had already endured that sign of Cyrene and God's providence. We looked at last week. as ordered by the Roman soldiers to carry the wooden beam the cross to the place called Golgotha, the place of the skull, verse 22. Golgotha was located outside the city gates of Jerusalem along a major highway so that the crucified victims would be visible for all to see. It was a place of shame. It was a place of execution. It was a place of public display. Cursed is everyone that hang upon a tree, the Bible reminds us in Galatians and in Deuteronomy. It was likely the execution site where many crucifixions took place. Some scholars believe this horrific place of execution, Golgotha, looked like a skull on a hill. When Christ arrived at the place of execution, the place of the crucifixion, just before he is nailed to the cross, he is offered a drink, verse 23. And they gave him the drink wine mingled with mirth, but he received it not. Mirth was a narcotic 
which helped to a certain extent to numb the senses, to give you a certain relief because the pain, the physical suffering was horrific. So they offered Christ a drink of mirth to try and numb the senses. A type of pain, deadening medication. But Jesus refused to drink it as he wanted to maintain his full awareness as Christ, folks, was in complete control of this situation. To complete and full awareness, full clarity, his full atoning work as he laid down his life voluntarily. No one could put him on the cross, not unless he permitted it. He could have called twelve legions of angels down, he could have wiped them out himself. And split sergeant. But in his love, he voluntarily went to a cruel tree. As we go on here at this scene of crucifixion, so first of all, we've seen the, the drink at the crucifixion in verse 23. He was in his right frame of mind, totally aware, total glory. Nothing was complex, complicated to him. He was on a mission, you see, he was completely in the Father's will. It was no accident that Jesus Christ ended up in this position. The hill, the place of execution. The Lord knew before the foundation of the world, this is where he was born. The redeemed people and themselves. And as we, as we continue on in this scene of crucifixion, we discover exactly here the distributing, the distributing at the crucifixion. Verse 24, and when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them. What every man should take, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them. What every man should take. As Jesus was placed on the cross naked, folks, the Lord was hanging on the cross naked. The garments of Christ were distributed amongst the Roman soldiers at the crucifixion scene. The tax houses and when they had crucified him. Verse 24 a. Crucifixion, as one Roman writer describes it, as the cruelest and most hideous punishment possible. It was a place of public shame. Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. This form of execution originated in Persia, but became very prominent to the Romans as a brutal means of inflicting death on its victims. It is estimated by the time of Christ, Rome had crucified 30,000 or so people in Israel alone. And after the Jewish revolt and fall of Jerusalem and AD 70 under Titus, the Romans ran out of timber to make crosses for the Jewish rabbis to be crucified. Such brutality, such execution, total merciless people these Romans were, Roman soldiers and their system. Victims of crucifixion were normally first scourged, which resulted in severe injuries or even death at times and also massive blood loss. Then the victim was forced on his back and nailed to the cross, measuring five to seven inches long nails, which pierced into the hands and feet, causing severe bouts of intense pain. The cross was then slowly raised upright, vertical, and placed in a deep post hole which caused excruciating pain with a reverberating thud. The normal cause of death was a slow suffocation process regarding crucifixion. It was a slow suffocation process. It wasn't fast. As the pain intensified, 
Each sacking while on the cross, it was relentless as the victim grew tired, experienced muscle spasms, and his ability to breathe became increasingly hindered with the result of death. So after securing Jesus on the cross, the Roman soldiers divided Jesus' garments among themselves. In verse 24b it says, They parted his garments, casting knots upon them, what every man should take. The garment seemed to consist of an outer garment, a tunic or a coat, a loose garment, typically sleeveless, which reached to the knees, and an inner garment as well. And the Jewish custom, and many, many also would have wore a belt and sandals as well. Prophecy was being fulfilled by the soldiers' actions. It says in Psalm 22, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. How accurate God's word is. A thousand years preceding this actual account of Christ's crucifixion. This was recorded a thousand years before this to the psalmist. They parted my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. The Roman soldiers divided the garments into four according to the Apostle John. John 19, you don't need to turn to the time sake, but it says, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart. They said, therefore, among them says, Let us not rend it, the coat, the tunic, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Incidentally, it was custom for a squad of Roman soldiers, four guards in total, known as a quaternion, to supervise, monitor, observe the situation of the crucified victim until the person died. There was four Roman soldiers to every person who was being crucified on the cross. Their job was to monitor, observe, to make sure the person dies. It was to make sure no one would try to rescue them or else they could get any ease as well when they were suffering regarding the condemned victim. There was no mercy for these Romans. It was a brutal death, horrific death. This takes me to the third point of this scene of the crucifixion. We have the duration of the crucifixion, verse 25. So we'll look first of all at the drink of the crucifixion that the Lord didn't receive it. It was a narcotic of Hanes and Cain. The Lord was in complete control, complete glory, full knowledge. We've looked then at the garments, the clothing being cast. Thirdly, we have the duration of the crucifixion, verse 25. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. <coughs> verse 34a. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice. The blessed Lord Jesus Christ hung upon the cross for approximately six hours in total. From 9 a.m., third hour, the 3 p.m., the ninth hour, which was the same time the Passover lambs were being slaughtered on Friday afternoon around 3 p.m. in relation to the Passover feast. How coincided, how connected, how it was linked. God's lamb was now on the process of paying the price for the sins of his people. On Saturday, the majority of the Jews didn't see it. He came on to his own, his own received him not. The Lord Jesus made seven statements on the cross. He hung on the cross for six hours. He made seven statements on the cross as he hung upon it. And declared in victory, it is finished, John 19. Hallelujah. Meaning that the suffering was over and the whole will and work of the Father was fulfilled in Christ's ministry as he preached the gospel. He worked miracles and obtained eternal salvation for his people. It is finished. 
It is done. The transaction is done. It is accomplished. It is fulfilled once for all. The debt of sin was paid in full. Behold, the Lamb of God was taken away the sin of the world. As the Lord hung upon that cross. I wonder tonight, have you received Christ, the crucified one? He's not on the cross no more, he's in his glory. Have you received him? Have you availed of his ultimate sacrifice? Have you trusted in God's Lamb? Is your sins gone, folks? God will punish sin. And the only way you can have your sins gone, cleared, cast away, cleansed, is through the precious blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, being in relationship with him. If you hold on to your sin, your sin has to be punished. And if you hold on to your sin and you die without Christ, sins forgiven, cleansed, removed, you will burst, folks, in the lake of fire under God's perfect justice and wrath. So look at the duration of the crucifixion. Six hours he was on the cross. Quickly as we move on in this crucifixion scene, Fourthly, we have the title or designation. Title of the crucifixion, verse 26. And the superscription of his accusation was written over the king of the Jews. The title of his accusation, his inscription, the king of the Jews, was above the Saviour's head as he hung upon the cross. Above the head of every crucified victim, there was a wooden board nailed to the cross which displayed the crimes of the victim. Now the two thieves beside the Lord, one on each side, they will be, their, their, their crimes will be above them, what they did. But in the case of Jesus, because Pilate realised this man was innocent, I can find no fault in him. Pilate put this inscription, or inscription, on the wooden board which read, This is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. John 19 explains that work when he says, The King of the Jews here, in verse 26. This inscription above Jesus' head as he hung upon the cross, naked. This is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. It was written in Aramaic, it was written in Hebrew, it was written in Greek. The Jewish leaders would have been fuming, raging with this title given to Jesus. But Pilate was using this as a means of vindication, vengeance, aimed at the chief priests and scribes who had blackmailed him <coughs> into condemning an innocent man. This title would have been very offensive to the religious establishment, the Jews. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, etc., etc. This title, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, it was written in different languages, Aramaic, Hebrew, and Greek. This inscription, referring to Christ, was not a crime. Everyone else who hung upon a cross. Their inscriptions was crimes related to them while they were hanging upon the cross. But with Christ, you see, he was the innocent one, the innocent for the guilty, the perfect for the imperfect, the righteous for the unrighteous. And this inscription referring to Christ was not a crime, but was actually the truth. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, it was <coughs> more of a designation, a title. The one who held office of the promised Messiah, and which the prophets spoke about. The one who is the Son of God, the one who is the Son of David, the one who is the branch of righteousness, the root and offspring of Jesse, the Son of Man, the root and offspring of David. This inscription was placed high enough for all to see, and was written in three different languages. So that most nationalities could read it as it passed by going towards the Passover feast in Jerusalem. 
There could have been over a billion people in Jerusalem at that time, many from different nationalities, just like in the day of Pentecost, another Jewish feast, many nationalities came, and Peter preached that great sermon. So there was many, many people going past and making their way towards Jerusalem, just outside the city gate. And on that highway, they would have realized that seen this inscription, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Christ was rightly titled, designated this title, so that all could read it as it gave another proof that Jesus was the promised King, the Messiah. However, sadly, because of the majority of the nation's evil heart of unbelief, the Jews still rejected Christ as their king. In Luke 19, the words of the Saviour himself says that the citizens hated him and sent the message after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. We will not have this man to reign over us. I wonder tonight, have you humbled yourself? Has it been a time in your life? And you can confidently say with full assurance that Jesus is the king of your life. That's why we sang that song of him. King of my life, I crown thee now, now shall the glory be. Lest I, lest I for thy fond crown bride lead me to Calvary. Have you been to Calvary? Is Jesus Christ the king of your life? That is the condition, folks, for salvation, lordship. Lord and Saviour, Lord and King, to be saved, Christ must be your King above everything else, even above your loved ones, above everything else in this life. Christ must be the preeminent one in your life, the Lord and King who governs your life. If any man come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Is Jesus the King of your life? But sadly, the majority of the Jews would not have this bond to, to reign over them. So we've discovered the drink at this scene of crucifixion. The Lord did not take any narcotic to ease the pain. He was in his right frame of mind, complete glory. We've discovered the distributing the Roman soldiers for them, how they distributed the garments. And she asked us for the tuning, the coat. We've discovered the duration, how Christ hung upon a cross for six hours. We've discovered the designation or the title of the crucifixion, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. But very quickly, as we move on, quickly here we have the Jew in the crucifixion. The Jew in the crucifixion. The two thieves, one on each side of Christ, verse 27 and 28, and with them they crucified two thieves, and one on his right hand and the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, but saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. These two criminals, one on either side of Christ, were not just any thieves, but fierce robbers. It was a way of life for them. Who plundered and stole, leaving a trail of or trail of desolation in their wake. They used violence in their stealing exploits. They maybe have mixed the uh, Barabbas, in which Pilate released, who was a murderer. They maybe have mixed the Barabbas, we don't know. And his rebellion as his were sentenced to death. These two thieves were vicious criminals. But nevertheless, despite their evil backgrounds, the Lord had mercy and saved one of them. Whether it was a number of hours later or a number of minutes later, but we know it happened on the cross when the Lord said to one and today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Maybe the Lord in his providence used the sign, the inscription, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, which aroused the hopes of the repentant thief. When he seen the sign, the inscription above Christ's head, he may have reasoned within himself, if this middle man on the cross, his name being Jesus, then he is a saviour. If he is from Nazareth, then he would identify with 
reject the people because the Jews in Jerusalem and Judea had no time for the Nazarenes to despise them. And this man, this repentant thief, when he seen Jesus of Nazareth, maybe he thought that this person can identify with rejected people. Like the Sabine rejected, he thought, I'm on a cross. And if he is a king, the inscription said, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Then he has a kingdom and would then perhaps have room for me. Of course we're not told. But ultimately it is through the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, is the one who truly converts, is the one who truly regenerates, is the one who opens the heart just like Lydia of old, and is the one who reveals Christ through this repentant thief. Again at the cross, the scene of crucifixion, the scriptures were fulfilled in verse 28. And the scripture was fulfilled with Seth, and he was numbered with the transgressors. How accurate God's word is. This fact emphasizes that the crucifixion was not a surprise to God. God had predetermined, he had ordained it, he had planned the circumstances of Calvary, Golgotha. Christ was not taken by surprise or was a victim of the unexpected as he was completely fulfilling scripture, being in the Father's will. But finally, as we look, folks, regarding this crucifixion scene, we have the derision at the crucifixion, the derision. Verse 29, and they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking said among themselves with the scribes, he saved others, himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, let Christ the King of Israel ascend out from the cross, that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with them reviled them. The derision, the opposition, the mocking, the scorning of the crucifixion. The blessed Lord Jesus Christ just did not suffer physical pain at that moment on the cross, but also suffered much scorning as well. Three different groups are recorded of being derisive, scornful towards the Saviour on the cross. In verse 29, we have the spectators. In verse 31, we have the religious Jewish establishment, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes. In verse 32, B, we have the two thieves before. Christ wonderfully converts one later on the cross. Their derision, scornful remarks just give evidence of the evil condition of their hearts. Someone said, ridicule is the language of the devil. Ridicule is the language of the devil. The devil is a scorner. He's an accuser. I wonder the challenges tonight, how we use our tongues. Are we using our tongues to edify, to build up, to encourage? Or are we using them to scorn, to destroy? At this scene of crucifixion, there was much ridicule. There was plenty of scorning. There was plenty of hatred and derision towards Christ from three different parties. The spectators in verse 29 were some of those who praised the Lord a number of days earlier on. The church called it Palm Sunday, but it was actually the Monday when the Lord rode in on a donkey. And the palm trees out. Blessed be the name of the Lord, the Son of David, and so forth. Hosanna to the Lord. And part of this crowd who were at the crucifixion, they were praising him. A number of days earlier on the Monday, and by the end of the week, Friday, they were railing him, which we get our English word blasphemy from, <coughs> in verse 29. And they that passed by railed on him, 
wagging their heads. Oh, how sweet, how sweet and how fickle the human heart is. I'm sure we've all experienced it down through life's journey. People's your friend one day, the next day, you're, they're your enemy. How so many can change opinions about another very quickly. And some of these people at this scene of the crucifixion, they were praising the Lord on the Monday, and by the Friday, they were really blaspheming against Him. Just how the human heart is so deceitful and desperately wicked, Jeremiah says, how man or woman can be your friend one day and the next day they can hate you and despise you. They can be saying good things about you one day and the next day they can be saying terrible things. Radicating you. Then the religious leaders also joined in in verse 31, the second party. We have the spectators at this scene. The second party is the religious Jewish establishment. They join them with derisive, scornful remarks by sneering at Christ mock and mocking them. And verse 31 says, Likewise also the chief priests mocking said among themselves with the scribes, He saved others himself, he cannot save. That Christ, the King of Israel, the same now from the cross. They're mocking the little Christ as being a beggar, a counterfeit. A liar. Yet they were without an excuse because they knew about Christ, they knew all about his miracles, they had witnessed his miracles, many miracles previously, but willfully refused to believe because of their evil heart of unbelief. Then the two thieves mocked, in which they were in no position to mock. It's so easy how man can judge another, and the Lord says we take that plank or that beam out of the eye. How easy in human nature how they can judge one and not say their own faults. And these two things they mocked as well, in which they had no position to mock, but just to thread their ugly character by mocking them. Verse 32 b it says, revive them. And they that were and they that were crucified with him revived him. These three thieves. The word revive means to criticize, be abusive or angry, insulting in an insulting manner. Be abusive, criticize, or having an angry, insulting manner. Yet Christ in his wonderful grace and mercy saved one of these thieves. Either minutes later or a number of hours later on the cross. And it's no different, folks, as it flows. It is no different whatsoever. The Lord was mocked through his ministry. He was even persecuted as a young babe or a young boy when Herod sent Herod the Great in his bloodthirsty campaigns when he heard that the Lord was, was the king of the Jews. He thought of himself, I'm going to get this boy eliminated because he could be a threat to me. And even from an early age, the Lord was persecuted, the Lord was mocked. And even right up to his death, he was mocked. It shows you the wickedness. This was the most perfect person who done no wrong, who always done good. Look what he did for the nation of Israel. He cast out disease. He done miracle after miracle. He fed them. He raised their dead. He cast out demons. I wanted to do the put on a cross and the mock them even during the cross. And it's no different, folks, down through the history of mankind. From the fall of Adam and Eve, right down, God's servants, God's prophets have been revived, mocked, scorned. Think of Noah in Noah's time, he would have been the laughing stock. At their parties, they were laughing and saying, What an absolute fool building this ark. And they never listened. But who got the last say? It was too late, and God sent judgment, and the whole world was wiped out apart from eight souls, Noah and his family. And it'll be the same, folks, leading up to the return of Christ. Even Peter reminds us, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. 
But this time around, Christ will not be in his humiliation on the cross, hanging naked on the cross, but will return in blaze of glory and fire to vindicate, to execute judgment and vengeance on mockers, scoffers, Christ rejectors. There will be no escape, no mocking them. It'll be the time of their visitation. It'll be the time of the day of the Lord and vengeance, perfect justice. It'll be too late for the mockers. It'll be too late for the ones who is revived. It'll be too late for the scorners. It'll be too late for the radicalers. There'll be no mercy spurred. There'll be no grace as Christ will vindicate in perfect justice. As the book of Revelation tells us in chapter 6, verse 12, when I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. This is just preceding the second coming of Christ. And lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of her, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell under the earth, even as a fig tree cast of her on tiny figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it was rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. They're talking about climate change, dear friends. When the Lord returns, this world is going to be renovated. Every island is going to be completely the topography, the geographical layout. The continents are all going to be changed, the mountains are going to pass away. This world's going to be flattened. Well, just proceed the return of Christ. And it says in verse 15, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. There'll be no blaspheme of them, there'll be no mocking them, there'll be no scorning them. And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? There will be no mocking when the Lord comes in perfect justice and blazing glory. His coronation day. They've mocked him, and they're still mocking him. But there's a day coming, folks, of perfect justice, and there will be no scorning, no mocking. When the Lord of glory comes and blaze the fire to execute perfect justice, perfect wrath upon Christ the darkers, mockers, and scorners. I wonder tonight as it close, have you availed of this ultimate sacrifice? It is the only way you can have peace with God through the cross of Christ. Is he your Savior? Has there been a transaction in your life, a transformation? You've passed from death into life, that you know his spirit dwells within your spirit, that you've had assurance you're going to glory, that your sins are all gone, that you're a child of the living God. Folks, so tonight we'll look just at the first part of the crucifixion. And next time we'll discover the next part of Christ's crucifixion as God visits Calvary. We'll be looking at the spiritual aspect. We've looked at partially the physical aspect tonight, but we're going to look next time in the will of the Lord as God visits Calvary. The spiritual aspect. Are you in Christ? Are you saved? Knowing this force Peter reminds us, the mock, the mock prayer to the cross. And they'll mock until the Lord returns in glory, knowing this force that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. We can certainly see the parallelism today. There's no fear of God, and um, the land is full of scoffers, mockers, blasphemers. But every single word is recorded. And God will execute, execute, or execute perfect judgment, perfect justice, perfect vengeance on all mockers, all scoffers, all Christ exactors. I trust tonight you have a share share in Christ who has warned thee to flee from the wrath to come because of his coming folks. And this world 
is going to return upside down, renovated in the return of Christ. But ultimately, at the end of the millennial kingdom, it is going to be absolutely obliterated. <coughs> the Lord is going to bring in, usher in the new heavens and a new earth for the people of God to be with Him forever and ever. And the other students tonight, may God bless these few words to us. Thank you for your patience as we will sing our final hymn, 335.